Shalom and welcome to Heretics Standing at Sinai, a podcast for those in or adjacent to the Jewish community who are searching for a place to deepen their spirituality without sacrificing their rationality. I am Rabbi Jay Telrav, and each week we'll have a conversation about new ways to exist in the world as an intentional presence and ways of making our lives mean something. Whether you've been exploring Jewish spirituality for years, or this is your first time considering it, we're glad you're here. I'm joined this week by a newer friend in the journey of my life. Elizabeth Hines is a recent graduate of Western Connecticut State University. Her first contact with the Tel Rav family was as one of Julie's students in her Sociology 101 class. I teach a section each semester on Judaism to that class about the application of their sociological theories to our religious tradition, and that day I met Elizabeth. She and I began a series of conversations that have led to her embarking on the path to conversion. She's recently made a move to Stanford, where she is now a full-time employee of Shoki JFS and participates in just about everything offered at Temple Sinai. I'm excited to have her here because of her intellect, her enthusiasm, and her fresh entry into Judaism. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you for having me. I'll, uh, I'll start the way we have in the past, just by inviting you to think aloud about your journey recently, thus far, and whatever you're thinking about these days. Great. I was raised in a Christian household with parents that were pretty actively believing and went on my own endeavor through more so spirituality as opposed to religion and sort of found comfort in, and the comfort and security in my belief in God. Uh, but tying that to a religion was much more complicated and I sort of stepped away multiple times, but more concretely once I got to college uh, and sort of lived religionless for a little while, not faithless, but religionless. And always sort of wanted to try and find a religion where I fit a little bit better. And that led me naturally to Judaism, did a lot of research on my own, and pretty quickly became very interested in conversion, but didn't really know the best way to go about that. I was reaching out to rabbis and the tradition holds true of being rejected time and time again. So I decided, all right, I'll wait a little bit. And I, a couple weeks later, I walked into your wife's class. So that sort of changed things and now I am gosh probably nine months into the conversion process I don't know how much longer I have to go and I'm actually really okay with that because right now my head is full of thoughts on God and what forms I find God in how I relate to God and really just loving the tradition that I'm finding myself in wow what a beautiful introduction and a perfect segue into today's topic. The letters that we read from the fictitious Reb Yerachmiel are, are all over the map on topics. And so it happens to be that this week's topic, uh, the letter is about God. And since you and I have worked together on, on uh, the process of becoming Jewish, um, I've watched happen in you something not uncommon, which is those being welcomed into the Jewish tradition often value very, very deeply the ability to uh, explore, challenge, question, and then to construct their own valid, valued belief in God. And, um, and disappointing none, the uh, the letters of Reb Yerachmiel uh, do the same thing, breaking the mold of what might be the expected uh, position on a topic as central as God and providing us another opportunity. So before we begin reading, uh, this being an experience and exploration of Torah, we'll start with a blessing for the process of learning and making it a part of ourselves. Baruch atah Adonai. Eloheinu melech haolam asher kitshanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Amen. Here's the letter. My dearest Aaron Herschel, you ask me of God to define the nameless, to place in your palm the secret 
of the one who spoke and the world came to be. And here it is. God is all. I'm tempted to stop with this, to close this letter, sign my name, and leave you with this simple truth. Yet I fear you will not understand. Know from the first that all that follows is but an elaboration of the simple fact that God is all. What does it mean to be all? God is the sole reality. God is the source of all things and their substance. There is no thing or feeling or thought that is not from God. Even the idea that there is no God. For this is what it is to be all. God must embrace even God's own negation. Listen again. God is the source and substance of everything and its opposite. There is nothing outside of God. Thus, we read in the book of Isaiah, I am God and there is none else. Not simply that there is no other God, but that there is nothing else but God. It rained heavily during the night, and our village is thick with mud. I walked to the Beit Midrash this morning, and I stopped to watch a group of little children playing in a puddle of mud. They sat in the puddle, oblivious to the damp, and made dozens of mud figures, houses, animals, towers. From their talk, it was clear that they imagined an identity for each, a story that told the figure's past and foretold its future. For a while, the mud figures took on independence, a life separate and unique. But they are still just mud. Mud is their source, and mud is their substance. From the perspective of the children, wrapped up in the play of separate figures, their mud creations had separate selves. From the point of view of a casual observer, it's clear that the separate self is an illusion, that in fact they are all just mud. It's the same with us and God. Adonai alone is God, in heaven above and on earth below there is none else, from Deuteronomy, Ain Ode, there is none else, meaning there is nothing else in heaven or on earth but God. Can this be? When I look at the world, I do not see God. I see trees of varying kinds, people of all types, houses, fields, lakes, cows, horses, chickens, and on and on. In this I am like the children at play, seeing real figures and not simply mud. Where in all of this is God? Some would argue that God is a divine spark inside each being. Some would say only within human beings. Others would argue that God is above and outside creation, but I teach neither position. God is not inside or outside. God is the very thing itself. And when there is no thing but only empty space, God is that as well. I want you to remember two important words, yesh and ain, form and emptiness. Yesh refers to the seeming separateness of things, each thing having its own form, its own boundary, its own separate existence. Ain refers to the emptiness of things, to the fact that forms and boundaries are not real in and of themselves, but rather useful constructions of the mind. To feed myself, I must be able to separate my mouth from your mouth. This ability creates the world of yesh. But it says in Leviticus, to love my neighbor as myself. I must be able to transcend that distinction and recognize a greater unity without form. This is Ain. And which is God, Yesh or Ain? 
both and neither. Picture a bowl in your mind. Define the bowl. Is it just the clay that forms its walls? Or is it the empty space that fills with borscht? Without the space, the bowl is useless. Without the walls, the bowl is also useless. So which is the bowl? The answer is both. To be a bowl, it must have form and emptiness. It's the same with God. For God to be God, for God to be all, God must manifest both as form and emptiness. This teaching is called Shlemut, the completeness of God. To be Shlemut, God must contain all opposites. God must be both Yesh and Ain simultaneously. I've recently found a wonderful analogy to explain this teaching of Shlemut, God's completeness. It has to do with magnets. I know little about them, but this. A magnet has two poles, one positive and one negative. A magnet cannot be otherwise and still be a magnet. The two poles go together, and only when they are together can there be a magnet. Even if you cut the magnet in half, and in half again, it will always manifest these two poles, no matter how small you slice the magnet. Its very nature necessitates the duality of positive and negative poles. Now think of God. Yesh and Ain are the poles of God. God cannot be God without them. And they cannot be themselves without each other and God. This is what is meant by God's shlemut, God's wholeness. All opposites are contained in and necessitated by God. We will return to this truth over and over again, for it explains the deepest mysteries. But enough for now. I've sought to clarify and may have only confused you asked a difficult question, made all the more difficult because the answer is so simple. God is all. Bishalom. And that's the end of his letter. So I could start by asking a question, but maybe I'll just put it out there and say, Elizabeth, is there anything that grabbed you that you'd care to respond to or think about out loud? So many things. This is going to be a really great conversation. Mm -hmm. The first thing that stood out was calling God nameless. Because that, that struck me because there are so many names for God in the Jewish tradition. But I also think it ties back to this idea of Shlemut. Because we have so many names for God. It is full. There is that form in every way. But then also nameless in the sense that all of our names can be a name for God if God is within all of us. And none of them suffices alone. Exactly. You, exactly. you really do need both, you know, more than one name. You know, I would say both, but, it, you know, traditionally we have 72 names mm -hmm. for God. And so to, uh, to, to settle on one will never suffice. Right, right. Is there a name you've come up against uh, for God that has spoken to you more than others? Obviously, I use Adonai quite frequently in services and in prayer and all of those things. As I've studied outside of God or Adonai, I really have found myself with a nameless God. Mm. And that didn't really strike me until it was said just now. I happen to know that the uh, the lock screen on your phone has the words... Oh, yes. Ehiyeh, Asher, Asher Ehiyeh, Ehiyeh, which for a... A non-dualist, that is, somebody who experiences God the way that Reb Yerachmiel just described for mm -hmm. us, Ehiyeh Asher Ehiyeh, which is the name that God told yeah. Moses is my name, uh, means something like, uh, I am that I am, or I will be mm -hmm. what I will be, but it is this cagey suggestion of imminence and omnipresence that really speaks to many people. Uh, it is simply being itself, which is, I think, at the essence of what Rabbi Rachmiel just wrote to us. Yes. And oddly enough, I use that verse, I think it's Exodus 3.14, but don't quote me on that, 
that is one of the greatest ways that I find myself and God together. That's mm. one very powerful exchange I've had with the text. Mm. All right, before we leave this topic, I, uh, one more suggestion. I have, in the last couple of years, come to really appreciate another name typically used by mystics for God, which is Yah. Mm. Uh, it's the, the, the first two letters of God's tetragrammaton, yud heh vav heh. Mm -hmm. The Yud and the He, Yah, is this uh, exhalation of breath, and there's something very gentle and organic, holistic, about calling God Yah. Just the, the breath that is, you know, the, the thread that ties us to the universe. So this idea of non-duality is found everywhere. God is all, is, a, is the central expression of non-duality. And I'm going to return to this. I think this is, you know, one of the early deliveries of this expression, non-duality, in this journey that we're taking. And quite simply, it means there is not separation in the universe. It's really hard to stay with, but I'll say it now and we'll say it over and over again over the coming episodes. Non-duality suggests that there's no place where I stop and God begins. There is no thing in the universe that is not a part of God. It's not that God looks at trees, it's that trees are contained in God. And so I just you know, took a look at a couple of different examples from some of the major traditions of the world, and I'll, I'll say them out loud, and then I'd love to hear your thoughts. In Christianity, uh, this is from the book of Acts, uh, where it says, in God, we human beings live and move and exist. And in Islam, they say, La ilaha il Allah. There is no other thing but God. In Buddhism, there's lots of places. It's sort of central to Buddhism. But here's one from Ramana Maharshi who asks, How are we supposed to treat others? His answer is, There are no others. I love that. And here's a Native American tradition. When the blood in your veins returns to the sea and the earth in your bones returns to the ground, perhaps then you will remember that this land does not belong to you, but it is you who belong to the land. So what I've seen over the years, and I, I could keep going, I have lots more here, but what I've seen over the, over the years is that when you start to lift yourself into a mystical experience of the world, then the, the garments that dress up your own religion, whatever it is, begin to fall away. And what's left is a core perennial wisdom that we started with in the early episode, the perennial wisdom that there is unity. And we know this viscerally. We just have to quiet ourselves down and listen for it. Hmm. In your journey, growing up in, a, in an observant Christian home, did you experience any elements of non-duality? Does that ring familiar to you? No. Actually, really not at all. I mean, it was very much so. Actually, a great example of this. If you go into a Catholic church, you'll see the tabernacle where consecrated hosts are stored, and above it there will be a little candle. And if the candle is lit... There are consecrated hosts, and God is there. And if the candle isn't lit, that light is out. God is not there. Think, wow. Yeah. What about the more ethereal or non-corporeal uh, presentations of God? Is the Holy Spirit more ubiquitous or omnipresent in the world? Is yes. the Holy Spirit in that tabernacle if the light's off? So the Holy Spirit is one that can be perhaps more omnipresent. Mm-hmm if you're worthy. Mm. That's the distinction that's always made. Mm. You, technically speaking, under Christian theology, yes, you always have access to the Holy Spirit, but you're not necessarily going to feel that presence unless you're leading a righteous life. Mm. One of the common non-dual mechanisms or, or, or um, uh, analogies that is used is the ocean. 
and um, this comes out of Buddhist traditions, and Reb Yerachmiel will use similar presentations later in the book, but um, the, the demonstration is this. We think that we are waves, and we're individual waves that are being rolled across the top of the ocean, and perhaps as we head towards the beach and we realize that we're about to crash on the beach and be obliterated, there can be concern that arises because we think we're a wave. But in reality, we are just the ocean. And I hear elements of that here as well, where, where Rami Shapiro, the author, of course, wants us to understand that it feels to be separation, distinction, uh, uniqueness, an illusion will come back into the conversation a lot, but it's introduced here that it's illusion. When you you look at the little kids playing in the mud, mm -hmm. and they think that each of these little mud figures has personality, has experience, is somehow separate. Uh, it's an illusion. How do you how do you respond to the idea that it's an illusion that you and I sitting across from the table right now are somehow other? It actually makes me think of your wife's class because we talked a lot about this idea of solidarity. And frankly, it makes me think of the overarching idea that God is one. And that's one that I really loved exploring. So for myself, as someone who struggled for a very long time with feeling like an other all of the time, this idea that it is an illusion is actually quite comforting. And it speaks to my yearning, I will never have sufficient wording for it, but my intense desire beyond anything I've ever felt before to be part of the one. All right, I want to go deeper into something you just said. Okay. I relate to it, but I want to hear someone else articulate it. When you find the sense that you are not separate from the one, that there is an illusion that... Uh, when pulled away, could obliterate the sense of self because you are a part of the one. You said you find it comforting. Can you explain a little bit more about that? I can try. Yes, the idea of the self is important and intrinsically talking about being one with God. You as yourself are one with God. That's great. But when we look at other Jewish concepts like tikkun olam. That is not something we cannot single-handedly repair the world. But also looking at various different spiritual elements where there is no separation, I just, I think it, it's peaceful. And it's super hard to explain, but like, shalom aleichem, that united welcome that we all say. Or Lecha Dodi, welcoming in and no separation between us and Shabbat. I just find that incredibly peaceful. Even walking down the street. I always, this is going to sound weird, I love being in the car with someone who is just so frustrated with all the other cars on the street. You know, well, where do they think they're going? It's like, well, maybe they're going the same place you're going. We're all going somewhere, right? This idea of, like, there's really no separation between what you're doing and what they're doing. So the idea that separation is an illusion just speaks volumes to me. And what I heard in your example of driving with somebody is I think sometimes when you have um, such a clear challenge, it can help clarify. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you hear a religious doctrine that is so clearly not true for you, it really helps clarify who and what you do believe. It's part of why I encourage uh, people who are choosing Judaism to take a good hard look at other movements within Judaism. Uh, it's why when I did an adult confirmation class a few years ago, I took the entire class around to different religious traditions. We went to uh, uh, Buddhist environment and Islamic environment and several different Christian, uh, Eastern Orthodox, um, and Orthodox Judaism, because I think every time we see the way somebody else presents something, it clarifies for ourselves 
where we stand. What's interesting about that, though, is sitting in the car with someone who's frustrated, like sitting in a, in a, a church with somebody who believes something otherwise, you could, on the one hand, start to say, I am so different than what you're expressing. But the mystic would say, we are so much alike. Mm. I understand your frustration. I've felt it myself. Uh, you are me. I am you. As much as we want to highlight the differences, it really becomes unhelpful to do so. Mm -hmm. The other thing, too, which I think is is beginning to, to emerge in the, the presentation of non-dual Judaism here is the idea that you walk around in a dualistic world. It, it sort of has to be that way. He, he uses the expression, uh, I have to recognize the difference between my mouth and your mouth so that I can put food in my mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's an interesting challenge. The, the Hasids, the early Hasids, their goal was to spend as much of their waking time in a space of awareness of non-duality. Because to walk through the world, you have to look down to see where the steps are or you'll trip and fall. To function, you have to know who's a threat and who's going to embrace you. You have to be able to see a mountain in order to be able to climb it. If I don't lift my eyes to the mountains, the way the psalmist has us say, it doesn't change the fact that I am still one with the mountain. And if you can walk through life with that kind of non-dual mindfulness, you're really very, very close to living in the world with God consciousness. Mm -hmm. That sparks a few different thoughts. The first being two elements of attending Sinai services that I've really grown to love and appreciate. The first is the Shema that we said last night. I am one, and you are one, and we are one together. I think that perfectly captures Adonai Echad, but also God is all. And the other is the recent change that's been made in Aleinu. Ushma echad, Ushma echad, Ushmenu echad. I remember, I vividly remember, and will forever vividly remember the first night that that happened at Sinai, and just how impactful it was for me and the person sitting next to me. And I, I was still remote at that point. It was someone else who was not Jewish, and how much it stood out to them. So thinking about that coexistence, that limitless existence really between humanity and God is quite important and powerful to me but I love the direction that you took it in with nature and I've shared various encounters that I've had with nature and God with you but the one that I talk less about is my relationship with nature when it comes to sunsets so one characteristic of myself that seemingly did not make its way into my introduction was the fact that I'm legally blind and I can't see much but I love sunsets and I was I did a lot of nature exploration this past summer and just honestly have always had this appreciation for it since endeavoring into Judaism I've sort of implemented my own daily tradition where as the sun is setting regardless of whether it's pretty or not I say Ma'ariv Aravim. It's easily one of my favorite prayers to say. Recently, I was walking home from work, and the sunset was just gorgeous. It was beautiful. And I found myself thinking, huh, that sunset is beautiful. And when I see that beautiful sunset, I also feel beautiful. That, that idea of being one with the mountain, whether you're looking at it or not, I wound up turning with my back to that sunset to walk to my apartment, and I still felt beautiful with that sunset. That to me is a perfect explanation of how I relate to God and how I find myself with God in a nature context. Wow. That uh, brings up the, the Zen Kone, uh, these, these difficult 
meant to be pondered riddles uh, that are so commonly used. Uh, anyway, this one is, it goes simply, first there was a mountain, then there was no mountain, then there was. It reminds me of the song written by Donovan, and the idea being that we walk through the world and we see a mountain over there. Yeah. First, yeah, we just see a mountain. And then we have a moment, like you described just a bit ago, where a sunset or a mountain connect with us in such a deep way that our being becomes a non-separate entity with the mountain, or in your case, the sunset. There is no mountain. There is no sunset. There simply is. Mm -hmm. It's like what uh, Maharishi said, you know, how do I treat others? There are no others. Mm -hmm. There's just you. There's just God. So you live in that moment for hopefully, well, time becomes irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It might be just a moment. And then you have to go home. So you turn your back on the sunset or you climb the mountain. But the third step is, then there was. Meaning, you return to the dual world. You walk home. There's a sunset over your back. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's changed. Because you still feel beautiful. You're looking around. You're seeing the people on the street around you. They're beautiful. You're seeing the dog poop that the guy before you forgot to pick up or chose not to pick up. And you're thinking that and the guy who didn't pick it up are a part of it all too. First there was a mountain. Then there was no mountain. And then there was. We hope to live as much of our time in that third stage as possible. We seek the second stage because those moments are unforgettable. Mm -hmm. you know, I, my guess is you'll live a long time before you forget that day where you looked at the sunset in that particular new way. And yet you return to the dual world changed. I, I love that space. I find it to be so exciting. And, and, um, and again, I think the, the Hasids encourage us to try to stay in that space as much as possible. So here I'm going to mention two other references to non-duality in, in modern popular culture. Um, and I'm going to put links to both of these in the show notes as well. The first is a song by a musician named Billy Jonas. You ever come across him? No. Oh, it's, he's, uh, he's a fun one. Um, he's mostly playful. He does some kids' music. Okay. But this song that I'm going to refer to uh, is called God Is In. And the song is, is a litany of all the places where you can find God. God is in everything. He talks about um, God is in the Tupperware, and God is in the pantyhose, and God is in the nuclear bomb, and God is in the guru, and God, and he just goes on and on and on. And it's all about God is in everything. It's a very non-dual song while being playful. And so I encourage everybody to take a few minutes and give a listen. I'll put the lyrics and the, uh, the link for the song there. The second one is, was quite important for me. It was a TED Talk, one of the earliest TED Talks, um, given by a neuroscientist named Jill, Dr. Jill Bolt-Taylor. And what's interesting about this is that one day, when she was still a grad student, on the way to the lab, she had a stroke. And she was in her bathroom when the stroke happened, and it was in such a way that her brain was able to sort of still function and watch the experience while it was happening. And the clot in her brain happened in a particular location so that she lost her sense of separateness. And she describes what it was like. And she's not really doing so from any kind of religious point of view. But listening to her talk about observing herself was fascinating. And it changed her her whole experience of the world, it was, it was as if she had the most intense experience of no mountain. And after that has been irrevocably changed in the way she sees everything. So she talked about looking down at her own arm and not being able to tell where 
her arm stopped and the molecules of air around her arm and the wall that she was leaning on and the bathroom that she was in where those began. She couldn't figure out where the definition of her stopped and everything else began. And it's the most beautiful expression of a scientific approach to non-duality mm -hmm. that I've come across. Mm. Um, so again, I'll put the link for that TED Talk in the show notes. And anybody who's, who's inclined is welcome to seek that out. I think it's worth a, worth a listen. So I cannot relate to the context of a stroke. But one thing it does remind me of is my complete and total lack of depth perception. Can't see how far away things are to save my life. And depending on lighting and colors, I've had moments where, you know, if my shoes blend in with the ground, it kind of looks like I just go straight into the ground and there's nothing separating us. And I use that word us very intentionally. So it's a unique spot to be in, or I think I've explained this to you before, but when it's a really foggy day and how for once the world is seen how I always see the world and there really is no separation there. So while it's not a chemical issue and it's not the result of anything like a stroke, it is a more scientific approach to spirituality that I think is quite interesting and I'm very thankful I'm able to take instead of just being angry at the world for visual limitation. I benefited once from a, a, a description. It might have been Jay Michelson, but I can't be certain about that. But he reminded me that the, the molecules of the table you know, that you have your elbows on. Uh, if we were to put time in rewind and speed it up, just because 14 billion years is, is a long time, if we sped it all up, we'd have to go back 4 billion years, and by that point, the molecules of the table and the molecules of your elbows and mine are not formed into mm -hmm. the Earth, uh, and you rewind even further, and we begin to start making our way back towards one particular spot. And if you look around at that moment, you see that all the universe is all returning towards one spot. And when you get to roughly 14.1 or 14.2 billion years ago, just before the Big Bang, all of these molecules were jam-packed into one spot, one singularity. And... You know, again, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a nerd. Uh, everybody knows I love science. I'm a, a, a dork in that way. I think almost every year one of my high holiday sermons is based on the scientific discoveries of that particular year. But I really love the spirituality of, of Big Bang Theory, that it, it suggests that all of this stuff, as distinct as we want it to feel and, and as we need it to be in order to, to survive, we, you know, food has to be separate so I can put it in my body. But... When we, when we rewind it, uh, the food, the table, the stars, everything, it, it comes right back into a singularity. Mm. And I may have mentioned this before too, but this meditation I, teacher I just experienced over my sabbatical uh, would look up at the starry night and just identify one pinprick of light and say to herself, oh, there I am. And I just love that. I think I thought, it's amazing. Such a beaut and I've done it now since being taught that. I just think it's a lovely, uh, a lovely expression of non-duality. Wow. What a lot to think about. I would say that this is the most important letter in the book, but I keep saying that each week. Yeah. Uh, I really have loved the the exploration with you, Elizabeth. I'm so glad you've spent this time with us. Thank you so much. This is a wonderful engagement. Hmm. Well, for all of you listening, you can click below for a transcript of today's conversation with Elizabeth Hines, and you'll find links to the materials that I've mentioned. Each week, I leave you with something to think about so that your time with us next week will be built on something you've already been working on. So your homework this week is to ponder this question. 
we're going to be reading about creation. So have you closed the book on your understanding of religion's explanation about the creation of the world? And can you possibly show up next week to consider another way of looking at the idea of creation? If you enjoyed this and you'd like to be notified of new episodes as they come out, you can click on the subscribe button. And be sure to share the idea with someone out there that you know is going to enjoy exploring spirituality in this way as well. So, until next time, all you heretics out there, stand proud. Mm -hmm.